Welcome to the Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. I'm so happy you found us. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on iFiber One News Radio, KMAS, weekdays from 6 to 9. Well, good Monday morning to you. I hope you have a great start to the day and a wonderful weekend. Spencer, good morning. Hey, good morning. How's it going today? Good. How you doing, bud? Good, good. Having a good time at the uh, Hughes home. Picked up our uh, oldest daughter from the airport yesterday. She's here with us for exactly a week and uh, looking forward to that. I haven't seen her in quite a while, so that's fun. And the in-laws are... Uh, it's It's weird because it's great having them, but they usually stay... And then it's like a visit, like we don't know when we're going to see them again, but we're, we're all trying to kind of soak in that they're living here now, which is really exciting. So yeah, we got our, yeah. got our friends visiting from Reno. It's it's a fun time. What is the overall um, takeaway from folks who come to Grapeview as they leave for the first time? They they show up to Grapeview, they, they, they're, they get it, you know, they fly in or whatever, then they're driving and they drive through Olympia, and you keep going. Then you drive through Shelton, and you keep going. Either way, I guess yeah. if you're coming down and through Belfair too. But then, and then all of a sudden, you're on the loop, and it's starting to get pretty rural, but pretty beautiful. I mean, what's the what's the th- mood like for people who've never been there? Just how beautiful it is, really, and how green. You know, I mean, I think people don't realize like every state has their little kind of nickname, you know, and it's kind of cutesy and over oh, the evergreen state, but. I don't think people realize that until they actually get into the green of the evergreen state, just how green really everything is. And having come yeah. from California where everything's brown and so many fires, and I know we have fires here too, but California, it's like a given now that every fire season, half the state's going to burn up because it's so dry there and yeah. from all the drought. So it's it's like night and day. It's just it's like being in a fairy tale, really. It's pretty cool. Well, there's a lot of things to show off uh, today in the news that we'll talk about. It's another shrimping day, and I have it on very good authority that the shrimp were almost jumping into the boat. I mean, that's how um, bountiful the shrimping was last week. And so we'll talk about again today. Also, Latest COVID numbers, gas prices. We have some regional news and uh, cut a couple good interviews as well. Yeah, we'll check on the weather. It's going to be rainy today. We'll tell you the forecast for the week. Things will be changing by midweek. We'll hear from Dr. Alex Apostle, talk about the school uh, next school year and what's coming up for the Shelton schools. And also, I, I did a two part interview, really fascinating, with Richard L. Height, who's a best selling author, spiritual teacher and a martial arts expert on kind of a new form of meditation that he's helped to uh, evolve, if you will. He's He didn't create it, but it's certainly a new take on meditation, which is pretty fascinating. It's awesome. Mason County Public Health was notified June 13th of one additional Mason County resident that tested positive for COVID-19. This brings the total to 40 positive cases of COVID-19 in Mason County. Mason County Public Health continuing contact interviews. The patient, a female in her 60s, is currently isolating at home. State officials in California and Washington reviewing Amazon's business practices to determine whether the company is violating any laws with respect to the independent merchants that sell goods on their site. Wall Street Journal reported Friday that California is examining the retail giant's business practices, focusing partly on how Amazon treats independent sellers on its platform. Also on Friday, the New York Times reported the state investigators in our state reviewing Amazon's handling of third-party sellers on its platform as well. The reports cited unnamed persons familiar with the matter. Fox News has removed digitally altered photos from its website after the Seattle Times noted misleading images used in the network's coverage about a Seattle neighborhood that's become a protest center against police brutality and racial injustice. The Seattle Times reports that the Fox News website featured at least two photos on Friday that inserted an image of a man standing with a military-style rifle and that there were no disclaimers on how the images were manipulated when featured on the network's website for most of the day Friday. Fox has removed the photos and a spokeswoman said it was a photo illustration. Well, place goes downhill after you leave, huh? 
Oh, man. Large protests in Seattle over police brutality and racial injustices have again caught the nation's eye. But demonstrations have been part of the city since shortly after the founding back in 1851. This week, demonstrators have staked out several blocks near downtown Seattle. They've named it Chaz, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. They have demanded broad reforms and faced criticism from the president and called them anarchist occupiers. Similar descriptions of Seattle print protests have been used for more than a 100 years, stretching from large labor strikes before World War I to the massive 1999 WTO trade protests. I remember watching, though, I lived in Oregon at the time of those WTO protests, and I remember staying up late into the night watching all of that happen uh, and it was quite shocking to me, probably one of the first instances that I remember, at least live TV, of an area that I had been to, you know, that was under siege, really. And, yeah. and they came out with those that movie, I think Charlize Theron was in it, WTO or something like that. I didn't see the movie, but I, I remember the protests going on and just masses and masses of people involved in those. Oh, Yeah. The Washington State Department of Corrections says a prison is restricting movement at its medium security unit after more than 100 officers and inmates tested positive for COVID-19. Coyote Ridge Correction Center has confirmed more than half of its inmates at the facility are in quarantine because of potential exposure. Department officials say the announcement came after 30 corrections officers and 71 inmates tested positive. Another 33 people exhibited potential symptoms. The Connell-based prison has minimum and medium security units, but only the medium security unit is on restricted movement. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this, some areas in Puget Sound scheduled to open for recreational spot shrimp fishing today. All shrimp can be kept as part of the daily limit. However, because only larger mesh traps are allowed during the seasons, most harvests will be spot shrimp. So Marine Area 12, that's Hood Canal, open from 9 to 1 today. A couple more times through the rest of the month, we'll tell you on those days. Uh, South Puget Sound, Marine Area 13, Car Inlet is closed this season due to low abundance. Now, I did hear also not only that the shrimp were just very bountiful out in the water, but I also heard that getting in and out of the waterways uh, was a little tricky. There are some areas that are traditionally open for boaters to launch off, mm -hmm. but uh, some of them, because of COVID-19, have yet to reopen. So just be advised that um, your traditional launch points may not be accessible today. Um, and if that's the case, just say, okay, and we'll move on, find something else. But uh, yeah, get those boats in the water because those the shrimp are there. Oh, I remember man. a few years back, People would throw in, and they they wouldn't find anything. They would hardly get a single catch, and you know, and you're getting over your limit. You have to put some back uh, because your your um, shrimp pots are just so full. Wow, uh, pretty amazing. That's nice. Yeah. Well, again, coming up on the show today, Dr. Alex Apostle, and we'll learn a little bit more about the upcoming school year, and we'll kind of get some information on a refined form of meditation, going warrior style on this one. Spencer has a great interview coming up. It's all here on the Daybreak Show. Good morning. From the iFiber One News Radio Studios, you're listening to Daybreak. And good morning, everybody. Jeff Slakey and Spencer Hughes here continue on during daybreak. And we're talking now with uh, Dr. Alex Apostle from the Shelton School District. Now, on Friday, I told everybody uh, that we were holding off on the interview with Dr. Apostle uh, because we were all starting to digest what uh, Chris Reichdahl, the superintendent of schools for Washington State, had said during his press conference and then the subsequent 43 or 47-page document that came out uh, from that. So we were given... Alex and, and the school district, a little bit of time to understand what was in there. So now, Alex, good morning. And yes, what was in there? Good morning, Jeff. And it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I've, I've read uh, 27 pages of the report so far, and I intend to review the entire document over the weekend. But um, one of the things that, that was a little concerning was when uh, Superintendent Reichdahl indicated that we would be returning to school face to face. And I'm, I just worry a little bit uh, that that might be misinterpreted uh, by staff and students. But 
you know, I think what he meant is that we're going to start school and there's going to be a variety of, of ways that we will start school that are on the table. And we have our subcommittees that are working diligently on, on that particular factor. But uh, I, I just want to let people know that the safety and security, the health and safety of our students and our staff is continues to be of paramount importance. So anything that we come up with will be uh, based on making sure that we have a safe place for our staff and our students to come to school. One, so yeah. very important. One thing I did notice and listen to during that uh, press conference was he he did – talk a lot too about based on where your county is at. And I think that leads into just what you were talking about with these citizen advisory groups that are um, area specific that know not only uh, the demo of the of the kids that that are there, but the makeup of the teachers and staff, because there was a lot of, and rightly so, questions about, okay, all the little kids are coming back to school. Uh, That's great. And while we may not have necessarily seen scientific evidence showing that small children were particularly susceptible to symptoms of COVID-19, they very well could still be carriers. And as they interact with uh, a varying age of teachers and then come home to their parents or grandparents, there's a lot of, lot of concern with folks that I talk to about, yeah, how, how is this all going to work? And, and is one, is the state going to really kind of mandate everything that happens or, or the, is the local control really going to be there? I think we have, based on what I know as of today, June 12th, is that the local school districts uh, have a lot of control in terms of the way school is going to begin within the general pr- parameters and in some cases specific parameters that have been mentioned in the state uh, guidelines. So um, these are very complex issues and especially and, and the, the superintendent, the state superintendent indicated that we want school to start safely and, and we want our people to stay healthy. Uh, but it's up to the individual school district to make sure that that happens. And I can tell you right now, I've already uh, had conversations with many of our subcommittee leaders, and we're moving forward uh, very methodically and strategically to ensure the the safe uh, return of our staff and, and our students. And they've got a lot of work to do yet in a very short period of time. We've got about 80 days before the, the fall uh, is upon us, and we've got a lot of work to do. There's no question. You know, I, I also had some issues with the fact that we don't really know what our budget is yet, but mm-hmm. the superintendent uh, indicated that uh, there's a good chance we're going to be funded appropriately and that the legislature is making public education a priority. Uh, so when, when and if they meet again, uh, I'm going uh, forward on that basis. Uh, and hopefully we're going to have the resources necessary to maintain a very safe and secure environment for both our students and, and our staff and, and our and be able to communicate exactly what we're going to do to our families so they can be assured that if, when when kids come back to school, they're going to be safe. When when staff come back to school, they're also going to be safe. Um But there's a, there's a lot of work ahead. Uh, there's no question about that. Yeah. I think the document touches on a number of factors that are going to be very important to consider in our plan in the Shelton School District. And what's really great uh, is some of the same committees and same uh, issues that they were dealing with at the state level with the governor and L&I and the health department. We have subcommittees that correlate very highly with those uh, areas of concern in the state uh, report. So we're poised, we're positioned through our subcommittees. And by the way, we have over 200 people that have signed up for those subcommittees. So we have great representation. Um, we are also going to be sending out a very comprehensive survey to uh, that involves students, uh, staff, and families. And we're, we want to find out what their expectations are in terms of health and safety, in terms of the instructional program, when school starts. And that's going to be, that's going to weigh heavily 
on how we develop our plan or continue to develop our plan to open our schools in the Shelton School District. So uh, we're reaching out to uh, parents, to families, to students, to uh, everyone, staff, uh, to help us uh, correlate uh, the opening of, of school. There are some alerts right there on sheltonschools.org uh, that get you uh, alerts for let's see communication surveys and more. When I think about some of the things that you – when I think about some of the things that you were just talking about, it kind of likens back to when we all started and continued to talk about McCleary and the um, – the different areas of the state where some folks in higher income earning areas have a lot of means and folks in rural communities much like ours have uh, minimal means. And so as you talk about the budget and the way that uh, the state is is pushing upon us the fact that we're going to be getting back, when you think about your budget, is that the retention of – teachers and staff, or is that just even having and finding money for proper PPE and and whether or not each desk needs like a, a guard around it? I mean, yeah. where where's all that money going to come from? Well, right now, the, the main uh, um, factor that I'm concerned with is to hold on to all of our staff, both certified and classified. And we're working very hard with the uh, school board. We meet every Thursday at 4.30, uh, and we're going to be coming out in public in terms of where we're at in terms of the budget. And our main objective is to not reduce our staff, because in our business, if you don't have staff, you don't have program, and you don't have the support that's necessary uh, to support our students uh, in in terms of their academic endeavors. So uh, that's the number one. We want to hang on to our current staff because we're on we're on the road to doing some some great things in terms of our academies and pathways. We need we need our people to be able to continue that. But you brought up an important point uh, in terms of the health and safety issue. I'm hoping that the federal government or the state will give us the uh, opportunity to access additional resources to ensure the health and safety uh, of our students. We have things in place right now that we will uh, implement that uh, are working towards providing the very best for our students and staff in relation to safety and health. But from all indications, we're going to need some additional support, and I'm hoping uh, that's going to happen. One thing that you have done over the years uh, at Shelton is promoted the 21st century classroom model. Ex- talk yes. to me a little bit about what how you see the 21st century model as it relates to social distancing and coronavirus and, pan- and, and, and all this. The old school model of the, of the kids in the classrooms, and there's 20, you know, 20 to 30 kids in a classroom, and they're all in desks facing front, versus what we've seen – uh, well, like Mountain View Elementary become, it's a lot more um, open in areas, and it kind of, in my opinion or uh, perception, it uh, it lends itself a little better to more distancing for the kids and things like that. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's no doubt that the school will not open in a traditional sense, and I, I'm I, I'm really I really want to make that clear to our families and and parents and the listeners today that school will be different and uh, we'll be monitoring uh, a number of factors in relation to how we start school you know the virus the coronavirus we we need to make sure that that's on a downhill slope and that it doesn't resurrect itself because that would cause uh, some real problems uh, in terms of the instructional model Um, but what we foresee is a different schedule, for example, where all the kids aren't in the schools at the same time. Um, we're just looking at all options in relation to remote learning and the traditional classroom model. You might have a combination of both starting out, but depending on the virus and where that's going, we may go one way or the other. Uh, so when we have, we're going to have two, two plans, two options. One, to open school up, and the second is depending on how the virus reacts, we will have another plan uh, to implement. So there's a lot of unknowns. 
But that's why we have so many people involved in our subcommittees. And those people are extremely important because we want everybody to understand the total picture and, and be supportive of how we start school. And so those subcommittees and the people that are involved in them are critical. And then the survey that we're going to be sending out next week, uh, that's going to be important information as it relates to the instructional model in terms of health and safety and how we're going to conduct school in a, in a different day. Okay, I got one more for you here, and I'm going to have you put on your salesman hat a little bit. Uh, after the meeting with Superintendent Reichdahl, I saw a lot of comments on social media about, well, I'm not sending my kid. I'm homeschooling. I'm going to do the homeschool. I bring this up because registration is open. And if you're new to the district, you'll need to enroll your kids for kindergarten or a school there. So talk to me a little bit about during this uncertain time, you know, the continued benefits of uh, school education, um, school district education versus uh, potentials with homeschool. Well, there, there's nothing better than uh, the model that we we uh, left off with, you know, where the teacher's in the classroom and all the students are there and there's that interaction. What we're going to come up with is a hybrid of that to start with. And like I said earlier, um, we may have to adjust depending on circumstances, but I can I can assure the parents that we will have the very best environment possible under these current circumstances, which will include remote learning. And we're improving in that area every day. We're training our teachers and we're going to continue to train them through the summer so that we can offer the very best remote learning uh, for some of our students. Uh, there's just no question that the challenges are many, but the Shelton School District is prepared to address those challenges and we will provide the very best program for our kids and our staff. And speaking of registration, we have information right now on our website and it, and it deals with new student re registration and especially deals specifically with kindergarten registration and in-district and out-of-district uh, transfers. So I'm encouraging the parents to really take a look at that information. That information is extremely important as we develop our instructional model. Very, very important, especially uh, in our elementary schools where we're trying to balance out enrollment uh, for a number of different reasons. So uh, if, if parents and families would take the time to look at that website, that's it's on all that information is on our website currently and subscribe to what we're asking for. That will help us with a very smooth opening to our schools. Dr. Alex Apostle, he said it, the countdown is on, about 80 days until we yeah. get to fall. Right. Uh, I know you are a very busy man right now, so I'll let you go and get to your next uh, phone meeting there, and we'll check in next week sometime. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for your support. Good to talk Take with you. Take care. Bye. You're listening to Daybreak on iFiber One News Radio. Hey there, it's Spencer Hughes with Jeff Slakey. Good morning to you. We have an interview coming up right now that is in two parts. We're going to air part one now and part two coming up very soon. It's on a very fascinating subject. Our guest is Richard L. Height, who is best known for his book, The Unbound Soul, and uh, just an amazing story. Uh, we're going to let him kind of share some of his bio with us because it is just so rich and so fascinating to me that I, I couldn't do it justice. So, Richard, uh, good morning to you, and welcome to the show, and thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for having me, Spencer. It's a real pleasure to be here. Well, this is fascinating because from a very young age, I was always fascinated with Japanese culture, and I'm very envious that you were able to spend 15 years living in that beautiful country and learning martial arts and meditation and healing arts and it's it's kind of something like in the back of my head I think it's like a dream that in another life I'll accomplish that maybe <laughs> I, I don't know that it's going to happen in this one but I'm almost 50 now and you moved to Japan when you were 24 and I just am fascinated by this whole thing and the fact that you started thinking about these things, enlightenment and meditation and kind of these ethereal things that most adults don't even really ever get into and devote the time they should to learning about. You were fascinated at a young age. Tell us about that. How did this cross your mind at around age 12 or so? 
Uh, it actually, yeah, I, strangely, I watched The Karate Kid, and uh, that, that was what was my motivation for the martial arts. But I'd had, uh, about age eight, I had this repeating dream where there was this spiritual master that, that was asking me to, to find something, you know, some something important that would help people to, to live in harmony. And so that was a, that was the original thing. It, it was a dream that I kept having. It was just a repeated dream. It's very very odd thing that I still can't explain fully to this day, but it would repeat exactly word for word each time, and at the end of it, finally, I made a decision, which was I was going to dedicate my life to finding this kind of awareness that it was indicating, and ultimately, through the martial arts, that became my path, and uh, I watched the Karate Kid, and I'm like, I want to, I really want to do that, I want to learn Karate, and that's, that's where sort of my actual training began, and uh, got run over by a horse. About age 17, I grew up on a horse ranch. Wow. Did a lot of spinal damage. I wanted to be a professional fighter. Um, and that didn't work out after, after the spinal damage, of course. Um, my training was, became very, very difficult because most martial arts training is reliant on speed and strength and snappiness and um, you know, that sort of stuff, and my spine just couldn't handle it. So uh, my search ended up extending into other options that are less well-known. And I found out about a, uh, from a very skilled fighter, actually, it was... Um, one of Hoist Gracie's uh, the guy that started the what well, was now called the Mixed Martial Arts Ultimate Fighter Championship. The guy that was the champion a number of times. His training partner, I met his training partner, and he recommended me to go to Japan because it was this great guy in Japan, a real amazing master. And uh, so that's why I ended up going uh, when I was 24. Wow, pretty incredible stuff. And what I find fascinating about all of this with meditation and this particular brand of the total embodiment method we'll talk about and the warrior's meditation is that there's no it's one of the hardest things and i guess one of the most fascinating and open-ended best things to ever happen is that the human mind does not come with a a a manual you know our tvs do our all of our gizmos and our cars have big thick manuals and our uh, dvd players and everything and our cell phones (laughs) And the mind is something we could spend our whole lives trying to understand and never achieve. And I think that's one of the sadder things is that we have so much capability inside of us, so much potential, and most of us never reach it because we don't, you know, we're, we're stuck on kind of the TV existence and we're stuck on the mundane and we're stuck on junk food. We live kind of a junk food life most of our lives and, and most of us never break out and discover this stuff. And it's, it's one of the sadder aspects, I think, because And that's why I'm I'm heartened by the fact that kids these days are being taught yoga. They're being taught meditation. I was never taught that stuff in grade school. You know, I was taught reading, writing, and arithmetic, and all that's important. But this is such an important part of what a human being is that I wish I had explored at a younger age. And I'm glad that kids in this generation are getting a taste of this at a younger age. Tell us about the total embodiment method versus in the warrior's meditation. I know we'll have more time on my regular podcast to get into this in more detail, but most of us think of meditation is legs crossed. You know, you, you've got your hands on your, um, on your lap and you're kind of, Oh, you know, that type that's what most people stereotypically think as meditation. We're taught maybe to shut out the outside world and just focus on our breathing, focus on stuff like that. But this is a very, very different approach, correct? Yes. This is an approach that is born of, of martial arts training, very high-level, advanced martial arts training. And so I was looking for some sort of bridge between meditation and the training of the martial arts. I wanted it to be one seamless thing. And through my own explorations and training, eventually I came to a certain realization that there are essentially two, two types of, of meditation, one of which is completely dominated uh, the worldview and it's become popular, which is concentration-based meditation. That's where you, you concentrate on some one point, whatever that is. It could be your breath or it could be a word, or, but it's concentration and the goal, the goal is to exclude information. That type of uh, meditation is just not compatible with daily life. Essentially, it's a religious-based or renunciation practice to renounce the world for religious purposes. You go within and you cut off the senses and and that's great for a religious practice, but it just does not lead to any kind of integration into daily life. And since I was looking for an integration into the most hectic, most stressful, most intense moments of my life, the martial arts training, I needed to find something else. And so that's where my exploration led. And the total embodiment method is a, is a way of actually being in, totally inclusive with awareness. 
so that you can you can be on, for example, if it were the battlefield back in the ancient times, the master samurai is on the battlefield, and he's aware of all of the opponents around him at one time. But from a place of relaxation, it's completely counterintuitive. And then through relaxation and through this deep subconscious awareness and sensory awareness, he, he navigates his way through that that uh, that danger. That that blends completely perfectly with the stresses of daily life. So. Absolutely. I grew up in... Um Catholic school. I rejected it pretty early on, remained a Catholic kind of, uh, in theory, less in practice for a good chunk of my adult life, and then became kind of more spiritual. And I explored spirituality over religion and and, uh, organized religion specifically. And I found that I was much happier doing that. And what I love about this, too, is you can detach even the spiritual from it, which a lot of people think might be kind of anathema to, to what meditation is. But after reading your book, The Warrior's Meditation, one of your many books, I realized that you can you can detach from that. Because I find that a lot of friends I try to talk to about meditation, they reject it right off the bat because they think it's kind of woo-woo. They think it's it's kind of otherworldly. They think it's new age. Uh, you know what I mean? Kind of junk. And I, I, I think you're on the right track going in this direction because a lot of people reject meditation because they think you have to be religious. It's praying. It's affiliated with some type of organized religion, and it really isn't. That's right. It's just, this is the, just the instinct of, there's an instinct of meditation that can occur under the right circumstances, circumstances that very few modern humans ever encounter so we don't discover it. So all, that kind of other, all other types of meditation are basically kind of contrived from the farming-type lifestyle that we have where there's not dangers, where you don't have to be aware of your surroundings. But in those certain specific um, experiences that would be akin to a hunter-gatherer type thing or, or warriors that are living out in the jungle, that kind of thing, a certain instinctive meditation emerges. And so that's what the warrior's meditation is really about. And the warrior's meditation is just the base level. Um, it's a bridging method to get people up to a certain type of awareness that my teacher and I were practicing in Japan and it goes through the senses. Uh, it's very powerful, and as you said, it's not connected to any religion or anything like that. It's just it's just instinctive. And so what we're doing through the practice is actually triggering a kind of inner instinct toward awareness. And it's, because it's instinctive, even kids can do it well. In fact, kids do it better than adults do, typically. That's part one of two of our interview with Richard L. Height, spiritual teacher, author, and martial arts expert. Richard's website is Richard L. Height, spelled H-A-I-G-H-T, richardlhight.com. You can find out about his books and how to order them and all about Richard L. Height on his website. Be sure to catch part two at the same time tomorrow. You're listening to Daybreak with Jeff Slakey and Spencer Hughes. Thank you so much for listening to today's Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. Again, I'm so happy and honored you found us and chose to listen. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of some of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on iFiber One News Radio KMAS weekdays from 6 to 9. Thank you so much again and talk with you next time.